Wahegru Ji Ka Khalsa, Wahegru Ji Ki Fateh. I'm very pleased to be joined for a special edition of CEO Talks um, by Kavita Puri, award-winning BBC journalist. Kavita, welcome to Sikh Channel. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. CEO Talks is a program where we meet high-flying executives, professionals in lots of different areas. I'm very pleased to be joined by you, a journalist, a prominent journalist at the BBC. Perhaps we can start with your early life. Where were you born? Can you tell us something about your childhood? I was born in, uh, let's call it suburban Kent. Um, and my parents were, uh, we, we were a Hindu family. And where I grew up, we were one of the first Indian families uh, where we lived. And when I went to school, I was probably, in my junior school, I was one of the only Indian uh, girls at my school and it was pretty in, in my senior school I, there were there were a couple more uh, British South Asians but um, no we were very we were not in a community with lots of other uh, Hindu Sikhs or Muslims that came that came a lot later and how did that childhood shape you did you find any difficulties because you stood out you looked different did you suffer racism um did I suffer racism uh, overtly? Well, when I was little at school, um, people would say things to me. I didn't quite, I didn't quite register it. It would, it would, it would feel odd. Like I remember one girl saying to me once, "Oh, I don't want to hold your hand because I might go brown as well," which I thought was really strange and hurtful. Uh, but I assumed that. Maybe it was because she wasn't used to seeing someone who had a different colour skin. But people were not in my junior school. They were not. No, they, they weren't. I suppose I was a bit of an of an oddity, really. Um, so I was, yeah, I would say uh, it wasn't, you know, it, given it was the, the 70s, it wasn't a difficult, it wasn't a difficult upbringing in that sense, no. So you had a happy childhood and you went on to study at university. Can you tell us about your university years? I studied law um, at university. I went to Cambridge. Um, honestly, I didn't want to study law. I wanted to study history. And I'm sure this is uh, something that's very common with uh, second generation um, British uh, South Asians like myself. I'd actually done the form. Uh, I'd, I'd chosen the college that I what was hoping to go to. And on the night before the form was meant to be going in, um, my uncle was there and said, oh, are you, are you going to um, study history? Do you want to be a history teacher? And I didn't want to be a history teacher. And he said, what, what are you going to, what, what are you going to do with that? And I suddenly thought, what am I going to do with that? And for years, my parents wanted me to be a doctor or a lawyer. I wasn't going to be a, uh, a doctor. Um, so I thought, oh my goodness, and I had a panic, and I thought, okay, I better do law because that's a good, safe subject to do, and I did it, and it was a wonderful place to study law. I was studying with some of the smartest people of my generation, but my my heart wasn't in it really, I have to say. And being at university at Cambridge in those years in the eighties, what was that? Uh, can you tell us about that experience as a a young Indian girl? It was the 90s. Uh, I'm not that old. Um, <laughs> as, an, as an Indian or as a British South Asian, the funny thing was, I didn't think about being British South Asian then. I think I was probably just trying to cope with the academics and the social kind of side of things. I didn't really, I didn't really think about that side of my life. You know, I was involved in the India SARC. I'd go to Diwali dinners. But that I would say, if I'm being completely honest, that wasn't forefront in my mind at that point in my life. Great. And just going back a little bit to your family history, your yeah. parents came from the Punjab originally. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about your family going back one or two generations, how they lived in the Punjab before partition? So, so my father's family was born in Lahore. And um, he, at the age of 12, uh, with his family had to leave, but they left in the months before partition because they sensed that things were getting quite bad. They lived in a Muslim area. His father was working on the railways and they moved in with a 
with a Hindu jeweler's family for safety, but they still, the things were deteriorating in the city and they were concerned about his elder sister who at the time was on the cusp of being 16 and they were worried that that she might be taken, abducted or, or at worst uh, raped. And so they decided that my grandfather would stay and carry on working on the, on the railways and they would move to my maternal grandmother's home in Moga. Um, and in the end, just before partition, my grandfather joined them and um, Moga ended up in India and they felt very fortunate that they didn't have to, to leave because they were prepared to leave. They didn't know which side of the border it would go on. And then eventually they made their way, the family, to, to Delhi. But I think after that initial upheaval, things never felt really the same for my father and life was quite hard when they were trying to remake their lives again and so he was quite young and ambitious he was working as a representative for Pfizer um, he'd done his first degree in mathematics but he was he was quite ambitious and a cousin of his had come um, to Britain and had said that there was this engineering company in Middlesbrough in the north of England and they were looking for graduate trainees and it was 1959 and he thought why not I'll, I'll try my luck my mother's family came from Dehradun, uh, Punjabi but that's where they lived and so actually they weren't that affected um, at all by, by partition um, but when my dad left um, for England he was unmarried and um, uh, they, they got married in 1969. Okay. So he was the first one from his direct family to go to England, and he went to the north. And you know, he spoke pretty good English, but the the, the accent was quite strong there. So it took him quite a while to get his head around that. But he was quite lucky. He was his 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 um his boss was a very kind English man who essentially looked after him like his son and gave him a lot of advice along the way. My dad refers to him as his second father. And long after he had left Middlesbrough, he then went to teach at university in Sheffield and got his PhD from Southampton and eventually moved to London. This man, Mr. Thompson, was a huge kind of figure in his in his life. So that's where that's the kind of brief history of my of my parents. And your career at the BBC, where did that come from? Where did this journalist streak come from? You were meant to become a lawyer, a doctor. <laughs> well, I, just, I went to the law firm. It was a very nice. Uh, corporate law firm. Um, I think I would have had quite a nice life, but I I made a decision that I was going to try and give journalism a go. So I thought I'll give myself a year and see if I get a job. And at the end of my year off, I did have a job and I decided to really go for it. And so I spent some time at Channel 4 News and then I went to um, the BBC. But what I'd always really wanted to do from quite a young age was work at Newsnight. That was my dream. I would watch those kind of political interviews and I think I really, that is what I want to do. And, and was, I got, was there I got an interview driving that to passion? Work at, Was there something got, driving your news passion? Did you have any particular issues that you felt very passionate about? Um, I felt passionate about stories, and even when I was quite young, stories that were the underdog, they were untold stories. I was always quite fascinated by that. I was, I've always been quite fascinated by foreign news, but also political journalism. And I knew that Newsnight did all of that. And they, they asked the kind of really difficult questions. They made pieces about things that I was really interested in. And so that was my kind of... That was my goal. And I, I got an interview on the first day of my honeymoon. And I tried to change it. I tried to explain to HR that I couldn't do the interview because I was on my honeymoon. They said, well, if you want the job, you're going to have to do the interview. So I was in India with my, my new husband. And I did, I did an interview on the phone. And luckily enough, even though I never actually met the editor, he gave me he gave me a job and took a punt on me. So I will always be quite grateful to him for that. And was it a struggle because you were perhaps one of the first Asian ladies at the BBC in this new area of journalism? And going back some years, was it a real struggle for you? Uh, being 
British or South Asian, not at all. And actually, at the time that I joined Newsnight, there were two other British South Asian women as well who were, had quite kind of and went on to have really senior positions. So I never felt that that was something that ever got in my way. What I did feel is it gave me a very different perspective on issues on stories in the morning meeting I would have come up with stories that maybe people wouldn't have thought about so I thought it, it made me a better journalist and I thought the things because of me and my background it was good for the BBC because they were putting the kind of stories that I understood on air. And you've stayed at the BBC for some time now becoming a senior correspondent you've had some very successful a series with the BBC. Have you ever thought about leaving and doing something different or joining another another media? For now, not because, as you say, um, I have. Uh, I'm not a correspondent, but I do. Um, I have done some broadcast journalism, and the stories that I've done especially for Radio 4, for me were very untold stories. So when I look back in the programme archives, I couldn't see the history of my parents in Britain or my history. And so I pitched a series to Radio 4 with three pounds in my pocket because three pounds was the amount of money that people coming from this Indian, from India, up from, from post-independence India could bring into the country, actually all the way up to the 1970s and I wanted to chart their social history in this country from the 1950s and pretty much you know in the same way that the Windrush generation had been had been charted I can see that having been done for the British South Asian community and so wonderfully the Radio 4 let me let me do that and put those stories on air and I think for as long as the BBC allows me to do the kind of stories that I would love to do and the range of stories, I don't, you know, I'm quite happy being there. Uh, and this journey that you went on, it seems to be in some ways a journey of self-discovery. It's you learning about yourself and because of your fairly, uh, your upbringing was quite different from a lot of immigrant communities. You weren't in an immigrant setting. You went to quite an affluent school and Cambridge University. So did you feel a disconnect with your past and you wanted to take this journey for yourself as, as well as the viewers? I didn't feel um, a disconnect because my parents talked about history and families and a lot of their, um, you know, they had a lot of British English friends, but a lot of their um, friends were um, from, you know, the Hindu, predominantly Hindu and Sikh communities as well. Um, and so, you know, that that was what a lot of my weekends were. So I felt very, very connected and rooted in that way. I think I was quite lucky that the way I was brought up, my parents never made me choose between different cultures. They told me to take the best from both cultures and try and make a way for myself. Having said that, what I felt as I grew older, and certainly when I had children, was that my history, which is a little bit more complex than, than most people's, wasn't wasn't reflected anywhere. I didn't I didn't know about my history beyond what my my parents told me, or beyond what I might read in a book, and that is what made me seek out the stories initially of people who first came to this country and what life was like for them and then do a social history of, of that experience and then brought me on to partition because a lot of people who came to this country, um, a lot of the Sikh community who came in those early post-war years, the reason they came to this country was, was because their life had been so disrupted by partition. Now, I tried to talk to my dad about that. He didn't want to talk about it. And so that was... The discovery for me and the more I spoke to people in the community about those early days the more actually I wanted to know and that led me on to partition and breaking open those stories that people like me and pe pe other people really um, you know you might know bits of stories within families but but people didn't really know about it people weren't talking about it in a in a kind of in, in, in a way that expressed how huge an event this was on all our lives and sh you know shaped our parents, grandparents' generation and if we're being honest, still shapes our community today. Partition Voices has become an iconic 
work for the BBC, very important for the uh, Indian and the Pakistani community here now in the UK. I mean, these voices, are they they're haunting voices from the past? Do you think yeah. time has healed now? Or are those wounds still very fresh? I think because people were talking about it, often for the first time, saying these words out loud, it, it was very raw. I could feel that it was still painful and people spoke still with great sadness. And I think that people had been shaped all their lives by this event. They just hadn't really spoken about it. And you can understand why they were coming here. They had to get on with life. They wanted to be accepted here. You know, they were fighting for equal pay, fighting against racism. Their kids may have been born here, didn't know much about life at home. And you just want to look forward. And I think something happened around the 70th anniversary. People are getting older, they're thinking about their life, they're thinking about childhood friends they may have left behind, their childhood home. And I think all of those things came together. And I think crucially, their children and their grandchildren, they want to know. Life is complex for British South Asians and they want to they want to understand. You know, they want to hear stories about the place that their ancestors are from, even if it's a place that they cannot go back to now and so it's raw and i think that for the second and third generation even though we of course had no direct um contact with that time it was still it's still there you can see you know trauma does in some shape or form get passed down memories in some shape or form get passed down and so I have never been to Lahore. It was a place that my dad always wanted to go back to. And yet it is a place I feel I have a huge connection with. And you're also trustee of the Victoria Albert Museum. Can you tell us about that position and how active you are with the, uh, the curation of the museum? So I was, um, I won a very nice award um, for one of my radio series and um, the, the woman who was uh, running the Royal Historical Society suggested that I apply and I went through a process and I got I got um, the job and it's it's a very wonderful and privileged um, position to be a trustee of the VNA and I am one of around 16 board members and I'm involved in board meetings, um, in committees, I'm quite involved in the new museum that's going to be um, uh, up and running in a couple of years time um, in the east on the old Olympic site. Um, so that's that's very that's that's really exciting and of course you know I speak to I speak to curators um, I'm, not, I'm a trustee, so I, I, I'm not involved directly at all in any shape or form in, in the curation. But it is, it's a really, it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful and privileged position to be. That's tremendous. And as a successful BBC professional, what advice would you give to people who may want to become journalists and work with the BBC? How would they can perhaps uh, gain a position with the BBC and progress? What... Uh, skills are needed and what advice would you give and, and any advice you can give at all to any aspiring journalists? So um, I would say journalism, a bit like being a doctor is a way of life and you never switch off. So if you want a nice nine to five job, journalism is not what you want to do. And it's quite hard to break into. Um, I tried to work for the BBC a number of times and it took me a while to, to get there. But don't be afraid. Go and go and ask people. You know, email me. Ask me for a coffee. Speak to people. Identify people that you think actually might give you some really good advice. Go and meet them. But when you meet them, have some, four or five really brilliant story ideas because they might go, okay, well look, why don't you come back and do one of them? And I think the thing about journalism is you live or die by your brilliant story. So keep a note of all of them. And if you're trying to wait to get a job, as as people do, blog, do short videos, set up a YouTube channel, um, set up a website so you can showcase what it is that you have to do. And I would say multi-skill. So make sure you can film, make sure you can edit, uh, and of course, make sure that, that you can write. And 
I would say be true to yourself. Never feel that you know you you don't you don't look like other people or you know you, you're you're not in the same mold. The thing about journalism is you will always bring something to uh, the table because it's it's your experiences. And you might have very different experiences from anyone else sitting in the room. And I think it's really important that that you you utilize that and celebrate that. And actually, difference is good. You know, that's how you get your stories on air. Kavita, any plans to return to the legal profession? Or will you stay with the BBC now? Have you been talking to my mother? <laughs> <laughs> Goodness, no. I think I'd be a terrible lawyer now. That's great. Award-winning journalist Kavita Puri with the BBC, thank you very much for joining us. We would like to share greater details about your book and series about partition, and we'll be bringing a, a mini-series for our viewers telling those stories and about your research. Thank you very much for sharing your experiences and something from thank your you. life. Award-winning journalist Kavita Puri, thank you very much for joining this edition of CO Talks. Wahiguruji ka khalsa, Wahiguruji ki fateh.